Good afternoon and welcome back to the National Regulatory Research Institute's Regulatory Training Initiative course, the introduction to the theory and practice of regulation. Over the past number of weeks, we've gone into uh, a variety of issues with respect to regulation, um, how we regulate, what we, what the products of regulation are, the standard of just and reasonable prices, why we regulate. Now we're in the process of shifting gears. Uh, and, and of course, the, the excellent uh, lecture by Sudeen Kelly last week on jurisdictional issues. Now we're shifting gears a little bit today, and we're really ending up on the cutting edge of regulation and, and why all of the practical issues that we're, we're talking about are, are so important in terms of the future and environmental impacts associated with uh, the utility industry. Uh, today, we're primarily focused on the electric utility industry, um, but the lessons associated with today are relevant, for example, to, the, to some extent to the gas industry uh, as, as well. We're so fortunate to have uh, Dr. Peter Fox Penner join us today to talk about utility business models. Uh, Dr. Fox Penner uh, has his PhD from the University of Chicago uh, in economics, uh, but he is uh, also an electrical engineer. So um, he's really quite got quite a nice background in terms of uh, formal training on both the uh, functioning of the systems and the economics of the systems. And much of what you'll see in terms of moving forward uh, involves a combination of engineering and economics. Of course, finance, accounting, and law all play an important role as well. Uh, Dr. Fox Penner has had uh, a very illustrious career. Um, currently, he uh, is running the uh, is the director of the Boston University Institute of Sustainable Energy. Uh, prior to that, he was the uh, chief executive officer of the Brattle Group, which is one of the preeminent uh, consulting firms in the uh, area of utility economics. Earlier in his career, he played a significant role as a principal deputy assistant secretary in the EERE office, the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office at the Department of Energy, where he helped transform the playing field with respect to renewables and the technology associated with renewables. It's my great pleasure to introduce Peter, but before I do a couple of housekeeping matters, um, as you'll see, um, as we've discussed before, submit questions either during or after the talk uh, through the Q&A tab. We want to remind you that you can find us on our NRI uh, YouTube channel. All of the previous courses and all the subsequent classes in this course will be posted on that channel. And also, um, it's with great pleasure that uh, we have uh, a presentation by uh, Dr. Fox Penner that he made uh, during the February NARUC meetings uh, discussing his uh, book, uh, Power After Carbon, Building a Clean Resilient Grid, which in my mind um, presents a coherent roadmap to the decarbonization of the electric industry. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Fox Penner. Thank you very much. Good, good afternoon, everybody uh, from uh, Falls Church, Virginia. That's a very kind introduction, Carl. Uh, very generous, um, overly generous. And with respect to my engineering credentials, uh, I do have two engineering degrees, but they are quite some years ago. Don't let me near any of the controls of any of the utilities you regulate. Um, However, I can change a light bulb, and there, therefore the old joke of how many Peter Fox Penners uh, does it take to change a light bulb is, the answer is one. Uh, 
But it's a pleasure to be here and, and talk about, um, as Carl said, the cutting edge of the um, situation. I'm gonna try and share my screen here. Oh, uh, please, this will work. Yep, looks good. Uh, let me try and get this going. And um, let me just say that um, today's course, uh, and, and it is a course, um, course lecture, uh, is about the future of you utility, electric utility distribution entities uh, as businesses and, and the, how to regulate them, uh, our future utility business models. Um, and I'll explain why I think we need them in just a moment, but I just want to say one housekeeping matter, which is this being a course, um, rather than me ha having my objective uh, of getting through my slides and making sure that it's all glorious and presented and Q&A only comes at the end. Um, in a course format, if there are important quest questions um, to clarify things, um, please raise your hand and Carl, I, I assume you'll be watching things and you can interrupt me and unmute people or, or ask them to me through the chat. Well, I think uh, the other, best, uh, Peter, I think the best approach is if people put their Q&As into the Q&A chat box, then I'll convey them to you. So we I, have uh, a, a little bit less uh, coordination in terms of getting people on live. That's perfect. I just want to point out to everybody that unlike a, a normal webinar or book talk, that which uh, I give quite often, and Carl was nice enough to mention, um, this is a course, um, and thus you, uh, all of you taking the course should feel free to um, ask questions, as my students do at Boston University, um, when they get when we get to something that isn't perfectly clear. Um, hopefully, this will all be wonderfully clear, and there won't be a lot of questions. But if there are, please ask. Okay, so we're talking about distribution utilities, um, as, as most of you know. Um, we have three kinds of distribution utilities in the United States, uh, investor owned uh, cooperatives and public power utilities. Um, and primarily I'm gonna be talking about investor owned utilities because that is the community that NARUC primarily governs. I know you have some other responsibilities beyond that sector. Um, and um, I would say that a, a fair amount of what I am going to say does apply to other types of distribution utilities, and even as Carl mentioned, to gas utilities. But that, but mainly, we're going to talk about uh, dis the distribution function or distribution portion of investor-owned utilities. So, first of all, let's let's step back a little bit and talk about what is a business model and what's the electric utility, it, uh, the typical electric utility business model. When I say electric utility from now on, I mean distribution utility. Um, and um, the first thing that um, I found when I moved from consulting to be a, a professor of the practice at a business school and start teaching this is that there's, there's really not a single accepted definition of business model. And in fact, people use the term very, very differently. Um, so um, I, I use the term in the following sense, it's to describe all the major dimensions um, that, that define what a business is and how it does what it does. Um, and those major dimensions, in my view, for any business are the mission and vision of that business. In other words, what is its overriding purpose for its existence? Um, the definition of the product it sells which may sound easy, but in so, but um, uh, inventing new products is, is a key part of the uh, market process and what brings us benefits. Um, there's the revenue and pricing model. Once you define the product, some, sometimes those are intimately linked and often they are independent. The go-to-market or marketing strategy, um, channels and all those sorts of things. The production process by which you're gonna make the product, which is uh, also in accounting terms means the, the majority of the cost side of your business. 
And that's, of course, that's one element of the business model. It's a gigantic multifaceted element that makes or breaks uh, any business and how efficient it is at doing that and whether it adopts new technologies and so on and so forth. In my world, I lumped that all into one element of being a business model. Um, the, next, the next one is the ownership or corporate form, which is a, a pretty well understood um, concept. And finally, the financing or capital structure of the, of the business. And if, and if I believe if you can tell me those things about any enterprise in the world, I kind of understand its business model. Um, now, for, for electric distribution utilities, which, uh, which are uniformly either publicly controlled or uh, in, regulated by folks like you guys, there are a lot of elements of the, of the business model that are, are constra constrained, well, even dictated by regulation. And in fact, I'm gonna do the next slide first and then come back. One of the key points I have tried to make throughout my um, sort of teaching career, you might say, um, in this business is the very simple point that for particularly uh, regulated electric utilities, and for most um, regulated businesses, extensively regulated businesses, the, the business model and the regulatory model are hand in glove. They really, they have to work together or you have an unsuccessful regime. You have unsuccessful regulation or you have unsuccessful companies. And that's undoubtedly intuitive to all, to all of you folks. It was a pretty radical concept when I talked about it 10, 10 or 15 years ago, but um, that's because people have had always taken the electric utility business model and regulatory model pretty much for granted. Um, um, the traditional business model, here, here are mo most of the elements. Some of them are pretty obvious. The, the mission is to provide universal, affordable, clean, reliable electric service to everyone. That's right in your statutes. And so that mission is a good example. Your regulatory statutes define the business purpose of utilities. They also, your tariffs define the product. Um, that's what tariffs are in my view. They are a product definition and, and understandably so. Traditionally, it's you know um, all, you, all, you, all you can use up to the class's amperage limit of a particular range of voltages delivered to the bus bar. Um, the sales and marketing strategy were really um, not much, um, not very important for the most essential of the 17 essential services classified by the Department of Homeland Security. Um, so there wasn't much in the way of marketing. There were there are various efforts over the years that we could talk about, but overall, Electricity is is the essential of essentials, and everybody doesn't just want it; they need it. Um, the production process. I mean, you, uh, the role. One of the core traditional roles of regulation was to oversee the cost side of the equation and make sure that it was efficient and fair. And finally, ownership financing models, investor-owned utilities. So the traditional model is pretty cut and dry. And really, you could see how it's in its intimate interaction between uh, regulation defining much of the business model and utilities pursuing that business model. Well, why does it need to change? Um, there are a number of pressures that will really be quite familiar to all of you guys uh, acting in the industry. So I'm just going to catalog them really quickly and, and try to go quickly through this and then get on to the other aspects of this, manage my time and get to the solutions. But it is worth acknowledging that these are the changes that really argue for, for moving the business model beyond the current traditional form. First of all, there is low to negative kilowatt hour deliveries. Um, and I put parentheses short run, uh, <laughs> You can tell we're talking about the electric utility industry because what I meant by that short run is for the last 10 years and the next few years, 
including the effects of the pandemic, but even beyond that. Um, we have gone through the first ever era in the, in the uh, industry's history in the United States where uh, big picture electric utility sales have been flat and down in some jurisdictions, up in some others where there's been strong economic growth from some power intensive industries. But in general, the United States economy is mature. Um, our, energy, our electricity using technologies up until now have pretty much saturated um, the, the, the products that we make, like the laptop I'm talking to you on, um, get successively more efficient with each new generation. So normal capital turnover actually creates um, more efficient uh, user base. And so efficiency has been offsetting um, the other drivers of growth. And we've been about flat and that will continue for some time. Of course, we know that puts uh, pressure on utilities if, they if their costs are going up. Luckily, we've been in an era of low inflation, but <clears throat> we we're also increasingly entering an era where utilities have to spend significantly at the distribution level to replace aging infrastructure, which is just aging out, but also to put in systems that are smarter, more, more resilient, um, give better customer service, um, are, um, allow for multi-way power flows so that I, as a prosumer, can send some power back to the grid, allow for much more sophisticated control of my energy use than, I've, than has ever been possible. Um, but that all takes capital investment um, and management time investment on the part of uh, distribution utilities. There's also a far more complex and demanding operating environment. All of you know this. Um, we're facing increasingly severe weather events and we will for the rest of our lives and the lives of our children and grandchildren. So uh, according to all climate scientists, uh, um, the weather will just get more unstable. Um, as I mentioned, we have to accommodate distributed generation demand response and all sorts of other new customer uses of of electricity and the way those, uh, the way we as users interact with the grid. Um, and that is, that's not just a capital investment problem, that's a real time operations and a business customer interaction challenge. And of course, customer service expectations in all industries have really taken a leap up in this era of um, e-commerce and digitization with 24 seven service, um, and 24-7 uh, chat and all of those sorts of things. And utilities have to, uh, and should, and are um, upping their customer service games to match non-utility businesses. The final risk is the one that I think is, is only now coming clear and it's only beginning to come clear. Um, I, I, um, I commend this to you as something to focus on going forward. And that is a risk of fragmentation, not, not, not necessarily technical or physical fragmentation, but you might say regulatory and economic fragmentation as more and more people wanna form microgrids and either take uh, ownership of part of the distribution system, which is now owned by and operated by utilities or at least operate it differently. And that could change the whole economic sharing and benefit balancing equation that you all by statute uh, as regulators manage. And um, so this is gonna introduce new challenges that we're only now starting to uh, think about and understand, get our arms around. So these are very new things. I, do not, I never read anything about any of these in any of the many books I kind of a, uh, amateur historian of the industry, and I have a big collection of wonderful books from the 30s and 40s, and you will not find this stuff in those books. So these do argue for changing, uh, for rethinking that tr simple traditional business model. Well, when utilities do this, and, and by the way, I work with many, many utilities as well as regulators, um, and um, 10 or 12 years ago when I started talking about this, um, the, whole, the term utility business model was, as I said, almost never even used. 
And um, utilities didn't, thought it was silly to think about it very hard. Now they all think about it, they all talk about it quite a bit. Um, for investor-owned utilities, um, I, when I talk to them or talk to you guys, I talk in terms of three big dimensions of utility distribution strategies. If you're a um, um, board of directors or a CEO of one of these utilities, I think you have three main dimensions on which you can act. Um, the first vertical dimension is that you can, um, tr usually through M&A, because the whole world's covered with existing utilities pretty much, through M&A, you can expand or contract your geographic scope of, of your operations. Um, and lots of utilities are doing that. You all know that. The Z axis, the diagonal axis, um, is moving into new unregulated um, affiliate businesses. And there's quite a lot of that going on amongst uh, regulated, in, within regulated utilities, their holding companies. You all, I'm sure, are familiar with that. And that's a, and these are, these are easy dimensions to put on a graph. But of course, these are gi these incorporate gigantic, um, multifaceted, make it or break it questions for utilities and their investors and directors and employees and stakeholders and and for you all. But the primary dimension I want to focus on. Peter, is can I interrupt the, you for just a second? Sure, absolutely. We, we 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 do have a question. Wonderful. Um, Thank from you. About two minutes ago, uh, about fragmentation and yeah. um, good. The Let's question. Go back to that. The the question Whoops. that we have uh, is how could this fragmentation occur? And I would add a one of my own questions, which was at the beginning of the industry in your books, probably before the '30s, it seems like the issue wasn't fragmentation but consolidation. That's so, that's that's exactly right. Um, but don't lose track of the first question, which was- uh, No, I, I won't. Okay. Um, and I'll only briefly touch on the second one, which is um, in the thirties, you had all these consolidated, these, these independent systems. And when they were joined together in a single distribution system, um, the economic benefits, the savings in redundancy, uh, reduced redundancy, improved reliability were so large that no one questioned the value of creating a single natural monopoly distribution system owned and operated by a single company. And so consolidation was, was motivated by the recognition of shared benefits vastly exceeding independent operation. We're, we're now at a point where people question that again, and they wonder whether if I'm a shopping center and, I, and now I have much better technology that allows me to not just decide once and for all, am I part of the distribution system or am I not part of it? But I have this fancy computer software where I can disconnect whenever I want um, and run alone, especially if they're gonna have a black, or maybe even if it lo lowers my cost to do that or for some other reason. Um, and so that's precisely how fragmentation could happen that folks who own microgrids come to you all or to your legislatures and petition for the right to break away from the system either permanently or under certain circumstances. And they say, I'm operating a, a, a business that's so important economically that you've got to let me continue to operate anytime there's a threat to the grid. And I don't want to have to support any grid functions even if I have black start, for example, and it's too important. And that's how fragmentation could happen. That just, the owners just of micro for the, Peter, don't, just for, uh, yeah. go ahead. Black Please. start is. Uh, black start is the, the, the ability to start up a grid that's been blacked out. And certain generators have the ability to, to do that and other ones don't. And you might have one in your microgrid that would be helpful to the system operators, but you might not want to use it for that, just as an example. So that's how fragmentation could happen. And uh, I'm worried about that because I, I do strongly believe as a power systems economist that 
that it is still true that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, but um, microgrid owners and operators could feel that they, the regulation or legislation will establish the terms of the sharing uh, operationally and financially and economically between microgrids and the rest of the grid. And that is a, a major regulatory challenge to make sure we get it right. It's good to have microgrids, but they should be operated so the benefits and costs of those grids are shared fairly with the rest of the system. Okay, I hope that helped. Uh, um, as I was saying, and by the way, I was great you guys uh, interrupted, so please don't be shy. What I was saying is that the, the, the third dimension and the one I'm gonna focus on for all the rest of the talk because it is um, most of what we do, um, is the regulated grid business model. In other words, regardless of what you're doing on your geographic span, and regardless of whether you're doing anything through deregulated affiliates or you assume nothing, by definition, you're a regulated entity, you're facing all those pressures I talked about in the other slides, you have a traditional business model and it may be worth thinking about changing it. And um, if you look in my writings and speaking and, and um, the book and all sorts of other places and lots of other good authors and thinkers in this area, there are getting to be some kind of generalized visions and descriptions of new business models. And what I wanna say is they don't completely abandon the old business model. We don't wanna abandon universal service and under no circumstances, we don't wanna abandon reliability, but they, they really do represent a significant augmentation and differentiation of the tradition, traditional business model. They are, they are much more um, in terms of what the utility views itself as its business, you know, all those elements of the business model, they all change significantly with additions and thus the regulatory model that interacts with them should change. And that's essentially, if, if, if there's no other takeaway from this class, that's the takeaway, is that all those business pressures argue for an augmentation of the utility business model. There are a couple of different ways to do it. No one is perfect, we're gonna experiment, but in any of those changes, they go hand in hand with an alteration of the regulatory model, which again is not wholesale throwing out everything we do in cost of service regulation by no means, but it's a pretty significant augmentation of it. And that means um, evolving into something, um, I think more appropriate, more sophisticated, more complex um, than what we're doing today. And that's again, my, my primary takeaway. So I talk about a spectrum of business models um, because really it isn't like these things are, ca are, are perfectly cast in stone and there is nothing uh, more to say or do about them and they don't move around. Um, and some of these are, not, are, are, are put in just to complete the discussion. So starting from left to right, um, some utilities I think will faced with all of those pressures and, and their own like strategic business decisions, they may decide to just exit the utility business, the regulated utility business, sell off their regulated assets and go off on those other two axes. And we, we saw it, NRG did it. Um, there's uh, European utilities who've done that since. Um, and um, so if that's true, they're off your plate and um, you know we wish them well. Um, there is, uh, the next orange point along the spectrum, passive distribution, is something that um, Chairman John Wellinghoff, my friend, and, and many others have talked about, um, which is to create DSOs, distribution system operators, um, analogous to ISOs that operate the transmission system, and um, essentially turn distribution utilities into passive owners whose systems are operated by these DSOs. Um, you know, that's mimicking wholesale competition at the distribution level. 
Um, as John knows, I don't particularly favor this model. I don't think it, it, it makes the most sense. I favor the rest of the spectrum to the right. Um, but it, it is one, something that's under discussion um, and will continue to be. So I'm gonna focus most on the next three models, um, yellow, green, and blue. Um, the green, the first thing I'm gonna say is the green one, the hybrid business model is simply blends elements of the yellow one and the blue one. And because this is a spectrum and nothing is perfect or pure or cast in stone, almost everything really has some elements of green in it. Um, so when I explain the two business models, uh, the yellow one, smart integrator and the blue one, uh, energy service utility, um, keep in mind that I have yet to see any utility that's absolutely religiously 100.00% one of these business models. I, I doubt I ever will, but they're useful to talk about as conceptual bookends. And they all also represent kind of aspirational models from the public policy standpoint. So let's talk about them. One's called the smart integrator. And by the way, the quick examples I have here of that are um, New York utilities under the REV and uh, utilities um, under the vision of the European Union, which has a sort of a single market directive for all distribution utilities in the EU. And on the energy service utilities, um, the other one you can see the examples are um, a couple of large public power utilities and Southern Company, but there are many other good examples of uh, utilities who I think are aspiring in these directions. And I don't mean to um, suggest that I have the perfect labels here. Uh, the utilities themselves may disagree uh, or the regulators may disagree. This is just my own opinion of where they are. So I do wanna spend a little bit of time on these things and I think we're doing okay on time. We're, um, I'm happy to say we're um, gonna have time at the end for questions, I believe. Um, but um, let me just describe the business models and, and briefly the regulatory model that fits with them with, in very, very general terms. And then we'll, we'll, we'll be ready to have a, a discussion. So the smart integrator business model is also often called the platform utility. And basically it, it operates a regulated smart grid offering um, to create, enable, or facilitate independent power and other services at market prices. So this is really a fancy way of saying kind of the evolution of a distribution utility in states that have retail choice. That's, and, and, and analogously, the energy service utility is really the evolution of the utility in traditionally regulated, uh, integrated markets. So, even though I gave these things fancy names, you can think of them as the, uh, the uh, descendants of today's um, retail choice utility area distribution models and uh, integrated distribution utilities. And they aren't even vastly uh, evolved from that. Um, but, um, if you look at the business model, there are some different missions. The, the mission of this utility is to facilitate markets essentially at the distribution level, not at the wholesale level, but at the distribution level to each individual customer and not just markets for um, uh, basically all you can eat bundled kilowatt hour services, but for much more sophisticated smart grid services. So the emphasis is on being a network operator not a commodity sales seller. And as a result, there's no reason why the goal should be to sell more kilowatt hours or to price based on kilowatt hour delivered. Um, there's lots of other services that these guys facilitate. I mean, they, and a demand response provider, uh, aggregator can't possibly do what they do without uh, their ability to, to intermediate through the grid and aggregate those load drops. That's a service the grid provider is providing that demand response aggregator that is different than providing that customer 
with the kilowatt hours it needs to run its lamps and so on. Um, now, um, uh, providing and installing energy efficiency measures in the home isn't a natural um, activity of this market facilitator. Um, and um, this is an area where I think there's a lot of hybridization because even in the areas where um, utilities, I think, are trying to become platforms, they're also continuing to offer and facilitate a lot of energy efficiency programs right through their own operations and even through their distribution tariff. So that's an element that, that really isn't aligned with this independent platform enabling role, but, is, but it's an element of hybridization that I think is very common in all the smart integrators or the aspiring smart integrators that, that I see out there. So I point that out, it's an element of hybridization. Um, um, this is uh, a graph that I'll just, I'm just gonna touch on it briefly because otherwise we could spend all day talking about it. But what's really different about regulating a smart integrated utility industry or, or an industry full of smart integrator utilities is that there's three overlapping markets. We see this in um, FERC order 2222, which jumps right into these very deep waters. But there are prosumer markets where prosumers may be allowed to, to trade amongst themselves. And you all need to set the rules and regulations to make that fair. That's analogous to um, microgrids fragmenting. But there's also a market between di the distribution utility, which is a smart integrator, um, and the intermediate enterprises that it uh, governs. Uh, and then thirdly, there is a bulk power market up uh, that we all understand is governed by the FERC and those rules. And um, these three markets have to mesh. If they're allowed to exist, if a prosumer market exists, it has to mesh with a market at the distribution utility stage, which would be defined by the economic benefits and products that are valuable to the distribution utility as distinct from the products that are valuable and priced and sold in bulk power markets. So you have three sets of product markets and you all and the distribution utility that you um, manage or regulate in this smart integrator world stand right in the middle of these three and have to make all three uh, work together. Um, obviously you will have to work hand in hand with the FERC that order 2222 is all about that. Um, but this is a, a very sophisticated regulatory challenge that would um, sort of, I, I, you know, not even be conceivable to the utility regulators and the utilities of the 1940s who created the system we have today. So, much of the discussion in my books and other things um, is about how to think about these three markets and, and regulating them since you're right in the middle of them. The energy service utility, um, you know, moving to the other end of the spectrum, it's really a mirror image of the smart integrator. Um, the, um, unlike the smart integrator, the, the utility continues to produce or or at least it, it produces or purchases and it sells kilowatt hours because remember we're in the traditional bundled service world here. Um, but, it, but because we're in a world where selling more kilowatt hours or I should say selling only kilowatt hours is not the business purpose or, or even shouldn't even be the fundamental economic driver of the, the mission of the energy service utility. 
it should understand its products to be energy services, heating and lighting, and all the other things that utility that utility customers buy power for. Um, and it should look at ways of providing those um, as efficiently as possible, bundling them with the delivery of electricity services and all the other services that the marketplace provides independently and in deregulated packages. Um, now it's, there are, there are some, and so in that revenue would not be based solely on kilowatt or so, uh, uh, kilowatt hours sold, but on other pricing units um, and the number of those units sold just as the smart integrator should also view, start charging for things other than just kilowatt hours. And now many of the things that the energy service utility does and the smart integrator do and current distribution utilities, wherever they are located, um, must continue to do. And that's, they must continue to deliver energy reliably, affordably, efficiently, they, they have, in other words, they have to keep the lights on. Um, smart technologies will have to continue to come into the grid. That's true no matter what model you're talking about. And um, we need, we were obviously going to need more sophisticated prices with some time variation on it in order to make use of the smart grid and to um, really evolve the industry towards a, a, a much more efficient and uh, decarbonized state. So that's the energy service utility. Um, and here's a little simple example. Um, I mean, this is extreme, but there are utilities starting to sell um, services not denominated by kilowatt hours. And actually, some, some of you folks who've, who've been around for a while and seen um, the more, in, there are examples of this even stretching back into the 40s. Um, one, um, some French and French Canadian utilities sell heat or chauffage. Um, and um, there, are, there are starting to be um, other sales of things other than um, pure kilowatt hour deliveries. And I think there can be more. Now there will still be the sales of pure kilowatt hours. Some of the, the bill will always be denominated, I think in kilowatt hours. Some of the revenues will be recouped that way. Um, for a variety of reasons. The point is it's not the exclusive driver of revenue um, and it isn't the, the sole metric by which a utility or a regulatory commission sort of defines the, mission, the, the, the vision and mission and accomplishment of that mission, vision by a utility. I'm having trouble with my M's and V's today. Um, okay, um, this is, a, a comparable um, sort of, you might say, chart of the markets. Um, and um, here the energy service utility sort of interposes itself again between the bulk power markets and prosumers, but um, it, the interposition is in a different way. You don't have these overlapping markets and price signals um, you have essentially economic signals and services consolidated within the, the energy service utilities and with the independent competing ESCOs that still exist in any, in any energy service utility service area, just as they exist in the service area of today's vertically integrated utilities. Um, and they're always going to be out there selling to prosumers. Um, so, you have a you have a different market arrangement, and that calls for different uh, differences in how regulators regulate the products and services in this business model. Um, in particular, in the in the energy service utility, um, there would be pretty significant regulatory challenges. Uh, there are also very significant and sophisticated challenges in the smart integrator model. I didn't make a slide for them, but I did make one for energy service utilities. Um, you, you, you're allowing 
remember your tariffs now constrain the products that that you that that bundle the or even distribution utilities can sell um, to those products and any new product that's sold essentially requires your approval in almost all the states I'm familiar with. And um, for an energy service utility to sell innovative services like screen hours and demand response and all other things, as you know, you have to go through an, a pretty extensive procedure for making sure that's done fairly without cross subsidies and undue discrimination and those sorts of things. And so that problem really um, uh, is uh, amplified in an energy service utility uh, world where you, we, we ag aggressively try to expand the, the products and services that utilities sell and, and price them differently than they're priced today. And of course, you also have um, controls over the amount of capital, what utilities do versus uh, in-source versus outsource. Um, you wanna make sure that utilities that are themselves providing demand response service and energy efficiency services aren't squelching innovation and competition, but there are good reasons I think for utilities to provide these things, either um, themselves or through partnerships with competitive enterprises. Um, and there's a variety of hybrid that I mentioned, and one of which I kind of call the ESU light. Um, and um, that's sort of um, half hybrid or, or half energy service utility and half smart integrator, you might say, where on a case by case basis, you decide whether the utility is going to try and do this through its own bundled operation or whether it should stay out of it and, and outsource it entirely. And not even just outsource it, but act just as a market mediator. And that's really, if you wanna to describe today's practices, that's sort of where we're at today, most of the time on a case by case basis. Um, you know, you say, how on earth do we regulate all of this stuff? Well. You know, it's easy for me as a college professor to say, oh, the answer is performance-based regulation. Well, as all of you know who's ever looked at this, this is a gigantic area of practice. It's complex, it's uh, evolving, it's far from perfect in any instance, um, but it, it is the only logical approach to regulating or, or to evolving regulation uh, in either the direction of an energy service utility or a smart integrator or a high hybrid utility. And really all performance-based regulation is conceptually is recognizing that um, a utility now has more measurable metrics for its fundamental business mission and purpose than just kilowatt hour sales. And that you can articulate those goals, you can measure those goals and metrics, and you can reward or punish the utility based on those goals and metrics, um, consistent with all of your other public service responsibilities, consistent with um, giving them an opportunity to earn a fair return on capital, consistent with non-discrimination and so on and so forth, but more metrics than just um, uh, your, did, did you sell what you thought you were gonna sell and therefore are your revenues above or below your last rate case? And we'll true you up in a, um, a decoupling proceeding. So that's performance-based regulation. And all, all of you have been doing this know that there are elements of performance-based regulation that have been around and kind of built in really often informally um, and often non-quantitatively really since I've been going to hearing rooms of public service commissions uh, 40 years ago. But this, but I think it's, it, it, it is useful and valuable to understand that we need to make this more, a more visible and explicit part of the regulation that, we, that we're evolving towards. And through it, work hand in hand with uh, our utilities and other stakeholders to evolve our utilities towards some version along that business model spectrum that best meets sort of the states and the region's public policy goals and history 
and politics and all those other things. So PBR is very, because it is broad and adaptable, um, it complied differently to smart integrators and, 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 and on a case-by-case -case basis, it's applied differently. But conceptually, I think it is the right approach. So um, here's the summary. Um, current business and regulatory models for utilities worked well for a cent century, but now need updating. Uh, a spectrum of new business models run be, runs primarily between, I call them the two exemplars or bookends or kind of extreme cases, the smart integrator or platform and the energy service utility that sells regulated services. Um, all models along the spectrum are being pursued and there's probably not one right answer. I, I can't tell you how many hours I've spent worrying about, since I've written two books on this, whether by the time the book comes out or two years after it comes out, it's so obvious in the industry that one of these models was the right one and I didn't say that. So far, knock wood, um, both models are really being quite actively pursued by utilities, by utility managements and I think uh, are consistent with what I understand to be the vision of folks from your community. Um, the important thing is that regulation must match the business model. Uh, regulating these new business models is more, more complex than cost of service regulation calls for PBR. Um, planning, pricing and other regulatory processes must evolve quickly and provide more flexibility for regulators and regulated firms without losing accountability which is a um, long-winded way of saying um, something that I think we all understand is really more and more the case in our regulatory proceedings. And that is given the complexity and the degree of change we're coping with, we have to be adaptable in our regulatory proceedings, in our regulatory views, um, and, and as nimble as we can be while still maintaining accountability and serving the public interest. In other words, um, change is coming on so fast and the climate crisis is so strong and so immediate and so impactful that the faster we can move the industry to decarbonization and the faster we can get to a smart grid and all the other benefits that we know are coming in this industry in an era where the electric industry is going to really um, increase in size considerably based on climate policies, the faster we can adapt to that, the better. And with that, I can say thank you and uh, take a breath. And I think we've got a few minutes for questions. And we do have a few questions. I, I didn't interrupt you because often there was a lag between the questions and, and you were on to another topic. So let me let me uh, begin. Um, uh, these new business models also seem to require changes as customer behavior in terms of awareness, product choice, et cetera. Is there evidence of experience that customers will adapt? I think there's lots of evidence that, that customers are um, adapting and changing their behavior. Um, so uh, what, having said that, there is the, the, the most important trend in customer behavior I mentioned is that customers continue to absolutely, even more so than ever, demand continuous, reliable, affordable electricity service, 24 seven, high quality. If you knock out their ability to go on the internet and you can't get them on quickly, they are even angrier than they were 10 years ago. So in that sense, customer behavior is, is only on a trend line that is really the traditional customer demands and wants. Uh, but customers, especially new Gen X and Gen Z are getting much more used to control, monitoring and controlling everything they use. I mean, uh, even my wife looks at her phone three times a day to see how many steps she's taken for heaven's sakes. It's mind boggling that your phone counts your steps. So people's, behavior with respect to their energy, there's lots of evidence that when they get more information about their energy, they do change or they're willing to adopt new products. They're much more willing to let their air conditioner say be controlled by a demand response provider if their phone lets them know when it's being controlled and lets them override it. Um, so 
there, uh, it's, it's too much to go into, but if you look at the companies that are doing this, they're, they're getting more and more successful. Um, I won't mention any names and the, um, the inf customers are just getting more and more used to this. And I think we have to understand that the successive generations of customers behind us, the, our children and their children, uh, digital natives are gonna be much more willing to adapt. Thank you. Um, do you see any examples of a distri distribution system operator either in the United States or elsewhere that have been developed? I haven't seen them yet implemented. I have seen them discussed. Uh, I'd be interested. Maybe some of you can put it in the chat if you've seen it. But no, I, I've only seen some discussions of it. And mostly I thought they had sort of waned. And then just recently I saw a discussion, actually it was in Europe, um, but nothing that's actually happened. Okay, do you uh, see any business model pressure on distribution utility, uh, distribution utilities from retail energy dere deregulation? Do you want me to say that again? I kind of- Yeah. Uh, do, do you see any business model pressure on distribution utilities from retail energy deregulation? Yeah, retail, well, retail choice sort of was one of the things that began this era. Um, retail choice per se um, itself, I don't think is a major driver of these pressures. In other words, if, if all those pressures on the slide weren't there, um, retail choice itself would, a utility would change into a distributor, but sales would, do, or, or deliveries would go up every year. Customers would be happy. There, there would be no smart grid pressures and so on and so forth. Um, so retail choice alone um, isn't doing it, but we no longer have retail choice alone. Retail choice providers are fast evolving into companies that want to provide not only all you can eat kilowatt hours analogous to traditional utilities, but also all these other services. And once you put the pressure on utility to provide and facilitate demand response and electric car charging um, and energy efficiency and all sorts of other things that accompany retail choice, then you get, you get the full suite of pressures. Do you see the series of uh, orders from the FERC, order 222, which, two, which you've uh, mentioned uh, 841 on on uh, de, de, der and yeah. storage Man and and, and, and um, creating uh, a, a aggregators that are essentially going to open up retail choice for uh, utilities that have not restructured. Um, I don't see it necessarily as as uh, forcing retail choice or opening up retail choice where it doesn't exist now. Um, uh, I don't think that that's required or necessary or automatically going to happen. But I do think that in particular order 2222 is going to trigger all of the complexities that I um, tried to illustrate in that, th that chart full of three markets where you have prosumers at one end and the bulk power market at the other end and the distribution utility and distribution level markets, which are different than bulk power markets. 2222, as I mentioned, will trigger, I think, enormous regulatory challenges for you all, regardless of whether you're in a retail choice state or a non-retail choice state. It's analogous to the two business models where the regulatory challenges are very large, but different. And so 2222 is really tough to contend with, but I don't think it will force necessarily retail choice per se. It's gonna force lots of rulemaking and mediation and new processes and things like that. Okay, so um, does the size of the market make one model more effective than another? For example, what? works in rural states with small number of ratepayers may be different from um, more urban uh, utilities. Mm -hmm. 
You know, that is, um, that's a superb question. It's spot on. And um, it's, I'm surprised that uh, it hasn't been asked more often. Um, if uh, one of the things, <laughs> economics 101, or maybe even economics 100, if a market isn't big enough to sustain three or more efficient competitive rivals, it's a, it's a natural monopoly, basically, in simple terms. So small rural or even small municipal markets that simply aren't big enough to sustain competition aren't appropriate for the smart integrator model, not because it's a bad model, but because the reality of any market, Carl, you know this from, you've taught economics 101, a tiny little market just can't sustain an efficient competitor. That's what a natural monopoly is. And, and some of these services are complex, have large cost structures, and you won't be able to sustain them um, in, in small markets that can't reach economies of scale. Um, so yeah, size does matter. In large markets, you can have either model. But in small ones, it will be much more difficult to do a smart integrator. And it's no surprise that in smaller utilities, mostly what I see is an ESU vision being preserved. So we've now um, come to our closing time. Would you uh, indulge us with a few more uh, questions? Happy to. Happy. Thank you. That's wonderful. You appear to have used the term microgrid to also mean self-generation. Is that correct? Is this fragmentation mostly driven by self-generation or are you imagining some kind of consumer to consumer trading? Well, uh, it's a multi-part question. First of all, the, technically self-generation I define as any time you make some of your own power. Whereas, and a microgrid is something more than that. Um, because a microgrid um, has not only the ability to generate some or all of your own power, and it's almost always some, not all, but the ability to generate some or own of your, all of your power, plus the ability to decouple from the rest of the grid when the rest of the grid uh, is threatened or some other conditions. And when you decouple, you can then manage your own use automatically. So I have self-generation on my home in Rhode Island in the form of solar cells, but when the, actually I, um, I, I can't operate my own house when the grid goes down because I don't have all the instrumentation on it to do that. Microgrids do that. Some homes can do that, um, but normal solar systems alone can't do that. And, and there are many cogeneration facilities, large and small, that aren't microgrids because they can't disconnect and manage all of their own power on their own. They don't have the circuitry. So that's the difference between a microgrid and self-generation. Self-generation um, does raise some of these same um, sharing of economic benefits questions, but we're deep into um, mediating them by figuring out what we, how we, treat that self-generation, how we credit it on bills and all of that sort of stuff. And you don't have what I would call fragmentation. You just have the pure question of how you share the economic benefits and costs. Great. So the question on the energy uh, services model, which is uh, what is the liability model or structure that protects customers for energy delivery? Hmm. I'm not sure. I'll try and understand that, but um, we might have to unmute the questioner. If it's a question of the energy service utility is going to say, install more air con efficient air conditioners in your home um, and charge you for that. And how do you handle the liability for that working? Um, the answer is that there are um, lots of performance contracts out there. They're used in the, you know, um, in the federal government on lots of public buildings. Some of you are familiar with them that allocate that liability and define the terms of service over the life of the contract. And um, 
the the util the you all will have to approve at least conceptually, if not line by line, uh, that liability allocation when utilities start working on behind the meter services. Um, but I don't think that is a problem too difficult to solve. It's not trivial. None of these are trivial, but um, the liability has to be allocated and, and it would not be, I don't think very different from the way it is allocated now to performance contractors, say federal performance contractors, even some utility owned performance contractors. And there's other commercial ESCOs doing this as well. So we're, we're moving, let's take a, just a few more. We're moving from a more centralized grid to a more decentralized distributed grid. Is there a point where additional decentralization undermines the benefits of a more uh, centralized grid? Or can additional investment mitigate this potential? Well, um, it really depends on what you mean by more decentralized. Um, the, um, I, I say it differently. Um, the, the growth of distributed energy and demand response um, and flexible load services and um, all of all forms of distributed generation or, or distributed energy resources, the growth in the amount of those doesn't undermine the industry at all. And that stuff is valuable and it's a part of the equation of getting us to uh, carbon uh, or climate solution and just creating a really customer friendly, economically efficient grid of the future. So the amount is, is not the issue. And so if that's the sense of it's more decentralized, no. The threat is though the fragmentation question um, where it's essential that we keep a unified distribution, a economically unified distribution system with most if not all customers still served by it and interacting with it on fair terms. And that is, is the risk that uh, in a quote, if, if you wanna call that the risk in a more decentralized future, that's, I would characterize it more surgically or more technically as that. Okay, why don't we um, finish up with this question, which is where have you seen the types of reforms that you've talked about start? And I think in terms of the role of the RTI, uh, the Regulatory Training Initiative, what do you see as the kinds of uh, skills that people who are taking these classes um, might uh, be interested in acquiring in order to become active participant uh, in those uh, reforms? Right. So I tried to give some examples of some utilities that I think are, are pursuing um, the ESU model. Um, uh, Seattle City Light, um, SMUD, LADWP, those leading publics who, who um, I think face the uh, uh, blessings of their city councils in moving towards providing more products. Lots of rural electric utilities are providing multiple products. And um, as I say, a number of vertically integrated utilities are, are pushing towards providing more and more services. Southern Company, um, uh, believe it or not, has done, is, is experimenting with a number of services to utilities. It has a, a whole smart home community where it's put in all of the smart home technologies um, and is offering them to the homeowners. Um, so, those are just a couple of energy service utility examples and smart integrators, the um, European utilities, because the EU pushed out a smart integrator vision before we did, uh, they're further along this path. Um, almost all the big ones um, in Scandinavia and Germany and um, France offer uh, or, or trying to facilitate markets for these things. Um, the Rev vision in New York, which many have heard a lot about, really had this vision, and it, and I think it's moved to a hybrid, but uh, was one of the first to put that out. Um, and the second part of your question on how can the RTI help, 
Um, or, or how can participants in the RTI participate? How can the uh, folks who are taking the RTI courses participate? Um, well, I, I think uh, some of you know this. I, I think what we need is really lots more of really focused peer-to-peer -peer sharing. So getting um, kind of regulatory experts who, who have a lot of experience with PVR in the room so with utilities and other stakeholders and folks like you and have not these broad discussions or discussions where everybody brings out their talking points and what, you know, what they're trying to, walk, to, to uh, wish for, but to talk about real concrete implementation um, steps, that's what I think would help. And that could be done in the context of further courses, you know, kind of in a course setting or in a workshop um, setting. But I think that's what I would go for, Carl. Well, thank you so much. I, one of the things that we're trying to do that you've successfully uh, accomplished today is to show how rich the, the kind of uh, intellectual challenge that we're all facing is. And, and uh, we appreciate your contributions uh, in, in providing us through your book, um, a roadmap to, uh, Put to, that thing down. Uh, Put that thing to down. Meeting that oh. I'm sorry. Th thank you very much, uh, all of you folks, for, for your patience. Sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but it's a great sign that there are so many. And um, you can email me at bu, pfoxp at bu.edu anytime. And um, thank you, Carl, and the, all you folks at RTI for putting this course together uh, and for shepherding me through all of the hoops I needed to go through to do a decent lecture. Thank you so much.